Hello, I'm Derek Arden and welcome to Monday Night Live. Tonight I've got Charlotte Olfrey on, who's an HR expert, uh, consultant in all areas of uh, human resources. Charlotte, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Uh, give us a snapshot of uh, you and how you got into HR. So like a lot of people, I actually fell into HR, funnily enough, um, started in a very much uh, contracts and policy based role um, and found that I was quite, quite good at it. So I used to negotiate contracts all around Europe for uh, doctors that were looking to run clinical trials. I worked for a, um, a pharmaceutical company that used to sort of put clinical trials out across the globe, uh, worked in the European division. So I did a lot of contract negotiation and obviously the pharmaceutical sector is very, very policy led um and that's where it sort of started from actually um but i sort of fell into it in that um having had my two boys um and trying to juggle a full time fairly heavy duty job on a part time basis um and then some relocations which meant i was actually travelling quite a lot of miles for that role um decided that it was time to sort of look for something else and i found an hr role very near to my home um that was part time um, and it was very much at the time when the Care Quality Commission was sort of starting to be put together and all the care standards were coming in. And I worked for a group of care homes and basically I set up all their policies, procedures, um, practices um, and got them up to, uh, you know, the standard they needed to be for the brand new Care Quality Commission. So um, so that's how I fell into it, really. That sounds quite a heavy job, actually. All yeah, it was. Yeah. yeah. No. Wow. Fantastic. So, um, while you're putting your slide deck up, um, yeah, and just go for it. Uh, tell us where you live, because you live in a really interesting place in the South Downs, don't you? I live in a little place called Pulbro, which is in the heart of West Sussex, and it's at the foot of the South Downs. Mm. Um, and if I look out the back window upstairs, um, I can see out over the Pulbro Wild Brooks. So it's very, very pretty. Mm. Um, and for most of the winter, because of the uh, the Wild Brooks, we look like we um, live on a lake. Um, so, yeah, it's very, very pretty um but um yeah so but i've been in the area I, well i emigrated from five miles away so i grew up in billingshurst yeah and i met my husband and emigrated to pulbra <laughs> oh wow you really lived then haven't you i have yeah <laughs> <laughs> a real globetrotter <laughs> <laughs> fantastic and that river that goes through pulbra in that gap ends up in littlehampton does it is my geography yeah. right or not Oh, good. Yeah, the River Arran, yeah, comes um, comes all the way down through Horsham. Um, yeah, it comes down through us, quite, quite fast flowing. Yeah, no, no, I'm glad my geography is okay. So I've passed the first <laughs> test. Here's the test for you. Tell us what all this mumbo jumbo HR is all about. I couldn't have put it better myself, but you wouldn't have <laughs> let me say that, would you? Well, I mean, it's a bit tongue in cheek, isn't it? Because actually it's not mumbo jumbo and it's actually quite serious um, and it can cost companies a lot of money. Um, but uh, it, there is a, a preconception out there that HR is a bit mumbo jumbo, depending on who you speak to. So that's why we always talk about mumbo jumbo. Sure. Um, but I'm just trying to see whether my screen is going to share. I'm on the wrong screen. There we go. OK, so. Um, what do I know about HR and who the hell am I uh, to come on Derek's show and talk to you about it? So, um, as I said before, I started back in pharmaceuticals. I fell into HR um, and the care sector is very, very um, HR heavy because you have recruitment, you have um, disciplinary grievance, policy, procedure. Um, you're dealing with uh, vulnerable adults. Uh, so there's a whole raft of stuff that goes alongside that. You're dealing with immigration because there aren't enough carers in the UK. So um, I've learned a lot over the years. Um, and I was a latecomer to doing my HR degree. So I did my HR degree when I was, oh, goodness me. So two, about 35 with some very small children in tow. Um, and used to sit at my computer in the kitchen under the biscuit cupboard. And once the kids had gone to bed at nine o'clock at night, finally, I used to sit there and do my homework till about two o'clock in the morning. So um, did my degree late in life to get my HR qualification um, and just sort of fell in love with it, really. Um, and as it's, that's developed, I have uh, I've taught now. Well, I've I taught, but I'm now a guest lecturer because actually the teaching is quite heavy duty. But I taught with Chichester College on the uh, degree course. So I was bringing other HR professionals through the practice. 
Um, I'm also a growth hub advisor for local businesses in the Horsham district on HR matters. Um, I've also joined the HR in a circle, which is run by the, one of the top employment lawyers in the country, Daniel Barnett. Um, and I'm a mental health first aider because actually a lot of what I do is based around uh, stress, um, you know, mental health, well-being and things like that. So we get a lot of people on long term sick that we have to be able to handle. So um, I've uh, expanded into mental health first aid as well. Um, and then I started uh, some involvement with another business called HRI, which is where Derek came and presented for us on Friday. Um, which actually is through the pandemic, it was very apparent that people like me that run our own HR practices um, are quite lonely uh, because we work in isolation um, and we uh, make a lot of decisions and we help clients make a lot of decisions that can be quite tough to make. Um, and so HRI was set up as the HR Independence Network um, and I'm providing some support to them at the moment to try and help get that off the ground as well as a, as a co-director. Um, so that's actually, again, to give back to the sector. I'm at that stage now in my career where I think I've got to where I want to be and now I've got an opportunity to give back to the sector um, and to bring HR uh, to you know help others put their HR practice together and understand about consultancy and develop their own careers. Um, aside from that, you can see a very lovely big chocolate brownie cake there and some other little fun things. I'm a very keen baker. Um, I'm definitely a home girl. Um, little dog called Maisie who keeps me on my toes and I've got a lovely family of three boys so uh, my husband's an Arsenal fan for his sins so I'll see the conversation at the beginning <laughs> that we had <laughs> so that will make some of us popular or not um, and my eldest son is a Peterborough fan because his uh, friend has just um, joined as a goalie so um, okay. we, we now have our Peterborough fans in his house too um, so that's just a little bit about me <laughs> Um, so what I have is I've developed, you know, a lot of experience and I've dealt with, I mean, generalist is quite an unpleasant word, really. I am an HR generalist. Um, but what that means is that I have dealt with most HR things over the years. Um, I always say, you know, never say never. Uh, every day is a learning day. Um, and I'm sure, you know, every now and again, something crops up. And I think, my goodness me, I didn't expect that to happen or I, I haven't dealt with that before. But generally, with most HR issues, I can I can deal with it and can cover it. But where this whole idea of HR mumbo jumbo and some very traditional ideas of perhaps what personnel was before was that it was very much T tissues and policing. And that's not actually what we do. Um, I do carry tissues as standard issue because I do actually make quite a lot of people cry. So um, that's you know part and parcel of what I do, which sounds awful. Um, but, you know, what you have to bear in mind is that you are dealing with situations where people are very much, um, you know, really involved in a situation. It might be bullying, harassment, sexual harassment, sickness. They might be losing their job. Um, a lot of it is the stuff that's quite sad. There's also the proactive stuff, HR strategy, which I absolutely love um, and getting people plans and, and business plans aligned. Um, but, you know, when we're not there to take over and be the internal police where people say, oh, if you don't do that, I'm going to get HR in here because that's not where, we you know, we're not here to come in and just troubleshoot and do the policing stuff. Um, we very much want line managers to be empowered to actually manage their teams themselves um, and manage them well. Um, so in terms of what does HR touch upon, this is uh, just like a very simple graphic, but the employment life cycle is basically everything from entry to exit of employees and how they move through an organization over time. Some move through a lot quicker than others, as we know, because they're not very good at their jobs or they have problems or they're unwell. Um, but it's how they move through. Um, and actually, HR has a touch point in all of these areas. So we have to have a very, very wide knowledge base. Um, and actually, as managers and HR managers, our role is very much to train, consult, coach, manage, mentor, and then ultimately lead when you get to sort of HR director level. Um, you really want to be sort of helping to lead the business through uh, what it needs to do. Um, but actually, in terms of HR, it's very much about what sort of ride do you think you're looking for? Because you can do very little on the HR front 
Um, and have, uh, as I say, this if you have this perception of HR being mumbo jumbo and not something you necessarily want to proactively engage in, then it can be a bit of a bumpy ride. Um, and, you know, we find, because I work with lots of small businesses, you find that you have situations where business owners and founders are working with friends, they're working with family, people are just helping out to help them get the business off the ground, and they have no formal arrangements in place. Everybody makes assumptions. It's things like, you know, well, I'm the boss, so it doesn't apply to me. And I'm the boss's partner, so the rules don't apply to me. Or, you know, I, I'm a friend, so I can do what I like. Um, and actually, you can find very quickly that you might have a very big HR elephant in the room because as you start to take on a team and you want the team to have more structure and you want to put more policy and process in place to sort of keep your business running... Um, and then you have this sort of split culture of, of people who um, aren't doing what they need to do um, or feel feel horrible because, you know, they're not afforded the same level of flexibility as perhaps the owner or the owner's wife or the owner's dad or, you know, how, however that works. Um, HR has a much wider remit than you think. And it does actually very much contribute to your bottom line and, and in so many different ways. Um, and so often there's a term used where HR are expected to show how they add value and earn their place at the table. Mm. Well, actually, you know, we 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 own the, the seat at the table because if you get the right people doing the right job at the right place in the right price at the right time, um, actually, that's going to impact your bottom line and how you want your culture to develop. It's very much, you know, how do you want your your employees, your team? How do you want them to engage one with each other, but actually with your customers? What's your brand? How do you want to be perceived? Um, and if you want to be perceived as a good employer, you're going to recruit it more easily you're going to recruit better people they're going to stay with you for longer so um we absolutely can add bottom you know value to the bottom line which i think is is sometimes overlooked so why does it matter and why do we care about whether we get the hr right so these things here i'm not going to go into all of these um, and it's quite a busy slide but um, the British Chamber of Commerce reckons that it costs approximately eight and a half grand to uh, go to tribunal. Um, that's probably a one or a two day hearing. Um, and that's just the cost of showing up. That's not the cost of any awards. So you could end up with um, basic awards uh, if you lost your case as an employer. Um, and they would be based on the Vento bands, which give different ranges of how much money you would have to pay. You might have to reinstate somebody. You might have to pay injury to feelings to them. You might have to pay the employee's costs. And of course, for, you know, two or three directors to turn up to a tribunal for three days, four days, it's a huge amount of time in terms of cost. You know, time and attendance is, is very costly. Time is money. Um, so it could cost an awful lot, actually, just to turn up, um, not necessarily any awards. Um, and some of the bigger figures there are things like, um, you know, sort of five day hearings. Um, and just as a voice of experience, I helped support a charity do a very, very big um, grievance uh, investigation many, many years ago. And it went to tribunal and it cost the charity £80,000 because there was uh, 14 days of hearing. Um, and actually that claim in the end was deemed to be vexatious and thrown out. Um, but the employee, the ex-employee, didn't have the money to pay for that and was a, a low income uh, earner. And um, the costs, they couldn't, you know, they were told not you, you shouldn't go for costs because it wouldn't be deemed very good by the judge. So £80,000 in costs. Charlotte, do you get involved early enough to try and avoid things like that going to tribunal and negotiate a deal? Yes, I mean we always try, but this this person but very very specifically wanted his day in court, mm. and there are some out there like that. Yeah. Um, and he he felt very aggrieved and that he had you know he had a case, um, but yes, I mean the the outcome was that it was vexatious. I've actually since seen by accident, um, looking for that court ruling because I was looking for it for a, for another reason. Uh, this chap's done the same again. 
uh, and he's actually taken another organization to try tribunal and it was thrown out then as well so some people will just do whatever they can but yes I work I mean I work with many many clients um, and I have never in Metro HR's history been to a tribunal um, I've had a couple of a very early settlements in ACAS conciliation but we've never got near the courts which mm. is always good news well, well done well done yeah so one of the things we, you know, in, in this is sort of generally in, in business, really, proper planning prevents poor performance, um, but it applies in HR. You know, it could save you lots of time and stress and money. And actually employing or engaging people in any way that you think you want to employ or engage them to help you run your business um, can be hard work. But what you don't want to do is make it harder than it actually needs to be. There's a lot of things you can do. Um, to you know, set the tone, set the culture, um, set some rules and some structure to to sort of manage expectations and to make sure that everybody understands where where they're starting from, um, because it's really important. Um, and actually, as a manager, you know, if we talk about leadership, leadership very much starts with yourself. I'm just going to populate that up because that's going to take ages to come up. There we go. Um, so, you know, actually, when you're running a small business or, you know, running a team and you are a manager, um, it's very much about how you decide to show up yourself and uh, leading is leading by example. Yeah. Um, and it's not, you know, it's not something to uh, that, that's specific. It's it's a general thing. If you want to take people on the journey with you, then you need to engage them. Um, and leading by example is the best way to do that because actually it's much harder to engage your team and get them to follow your lead if actually what they're going to do is is reflect and mirror your own behaviors um so it's very much uh, important it's very important to have complementary leadership and management skills you need to be able to manage the work manage the the um you know the stuff that needs to be done but you need to lead the team um, but, you know, if you're a manager, you, you've got to lead yourself first. And that includes looking after your work life balance, your health, motivation. But then there are things within the organization that have to be done, particularly if you're a business leader and owner or founder. You know, you do have to make sure that you do follow and keep up to uh, changes in legislation. Um, you know, as we know, with our, all the stuff that goes out, goes on in the economy um, and all those things, um, they can affect how you run your business. Um, and of course, we need to look after our team, uh, which goes back to the idea of the employee life cycle and how people move through the team. Mm. So what is what is a culture? So the culture is your um, your vision, your values. It's your working language. It's the habits and the systems and the things you have in place. It's your sense of identity as a business. It's who who are we and what do we stand for? And culture is often referred to in the HR remit as it's the way we see and do things around here. Um, but actually, it's also more about how it feels to work here. Um, and that's where we come back to this idea of actually, um, if you have an engaged team and it feels nice to work here, um, then, you know, and, and there is alignment with your vision and values as an organisation, then people will stay and they will work hard you know, and they will engage. Now, look, we've got a big yawn here. <laughs> this is the, the legal stuff. Um, now, I'm not going to go into the legal stuff because it's, uh, you know, half past five on a, on a Monday um, and we don't want to send you all to sleep. So what I will say is there is rafts of legislation to do with HR. And I don't remember it all all the time. Sometimes I have to go back and look it up. Um, but I think what's really, really important is that just to be aware that there are rafts of legislation. There's, you know, Working Time Regs, Quality Act, Data Protection, GDPR, anti-bribery, you know, it goes on and on and on. Um, but a couple of just little highlights is that um, in terms of the, the burden of proof, if you think of a criminal court, you have to prove beyond all reasonable doubt that somebody has done something. Whereas in the HR remit, it's on the balance of probability. Now, the balance of probability could be 52% that you 
you think they've done something and 48% that you don't. But actually that 52%, if you can justify it objectively as a reasonable way to behave and that you have, you know, made a reasonable decision in a tribunal, then you could win your case. The tribunals aren't there um, to tear apart your thinking. They just want to see evidence of your thinking and that you have acted reasonably in the circumstances and on the merits of the case. Um, some some key points are uh, there is a two year qualification period. A lot of people think that you can just get rid of somebody in the first two years. Yes, possibly. No, if there's discrimination or whistleblowing, because you lose that two year qualification if there's any issue around discrimination. Um, under the Equality Act, there are the nine characteristics uh, for discrimination, and we have to be very aware of those. And there are five fair reasons to dismiss somebody. Um, and if you're going to end up in a tribunal, then you would end up in a tribunal for either wrongful dismissal, unfair dismissal or unfair constructive dismissal. Um, and it's up to you as an employer to to sort of defend your position and who defends the position and how the burden of proof sits depends on what the claim is. So actually, sometimes with discrimination, it automatically goes to the employer to prove they didn't discriminate. Whereas um, with unfair dismissal, it's, um, you know, the uh, the employee has to prove how they've been unfairly dismissed. So there's lots there. Um, if anybody wants to talk about HR legislation, I'm more than happy to, <laughs> uh, but we won't do it here. <laughs> I was actually amazed how uh, how many um, new pieces of legislation are coming in on uh, in 2024 when that lawyer talked uh, at your conference. Uh, on yeah. Friday. There was one particular that stood out and I was trying to remember it like mad, which seemed a bit odd, but uh, doesn't matter. It was. Yeah, no, there's there's lots coming through. And actually, that's because there's been a lull since the pandemic, because because of the pandemic and the fact that, you know, Parliament didn't sit in the way it should have done. Quite mm. a lot of HR legislation just got parked. Um, and also, we're still we're still working through the whole Brexit thing. Um, because uh, at the end of this year, there is the. Um, you know, the law that says unless we've agreed to do something different, all the European laws fall away. So um, and a lot of HR legislation, some is UK based, some is some is European based. So we're still waiting for that to fall out. So, yeah, there is a bit of a purge for 2024 because we haven't had anything for a while. Wow. Um, I'm not going to go into all of these. This is something I do in a little training session where I talk to business owners around, you know, if you're going to take on an employee, what do you have to think about? Um, and this is just a little summary, really. It's not just a base salary. There's all sorts of stuff. There's pension, there's employer NI. Um, you must have policies and procedures. You need an employment contract. You're going to have equipment. You're going to have insurance, employer's liability insurance. There's going to be all sorts that you're going to need to do. It's not just as simple as hiring somebody and off you go. Mm. Wow. Wow. Um, I think Derek is quite happy for you guys to have uh, the slides afterwards if you want to. So again, I'm not going to go through these all one by one, but these are my top tips for if you are looking to recruit or if you are looking to build a team or if you are looking, you know, to advise anybody um, in any of your, you know, any of your contacts or anyone you come into contact with about taking that really big next step, which actually as an HR person, I'm about to take myself and employ somebody. Uh, to make your team bigger. Um, these are my top tips for some of the things that I think you should have in place um, as an absolute minimum. Um, and the other thing is just don't don't guess. As I say, there's a lot of legislation out there, so it is much better to ask the question. There are no silly questions, probably more silly assumptions than silly questions. Um, so um, it, it's much better to get that advice and, uh, you know, check it out before you commit because you could commit to something that's far more advanced than you realize mm. um it's not your area of expertise that's you know that's okay we've all got different areas of expertise um uh, but early intervention with hr is very much um key because i will be able to give my little hr crystal ball a rub and look into the future and think about tribunals and think about process and think about whether it is or isn't within the two year qualification period and think about whether there is or isn't discrimination or anything like that. So um, it, it's much easier to um, sort of scope that out and have that thinking. Um, and as an, you know, you won't necessarily have that if you're not an HR expert in exactly the same way as I won't have 
expertise in 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 what you have expertise in so um you know don't struggle early intervention is key ask the question so what are we trying to do all this hr stuff for um and you know how does it impact on our bottom line well ultimately what we're trying to achieve is employees that are happy and engaged um and you know the idea is that if you do some of these great things around building culture building vision building values making sure employees understand why they're there what you're trying to do as an organization how they fit into that and that you reward them value them and treat them well that you'll get some of these great um you know effects um in that they are you know happy to move with change they will you know be constant learners they'll be engaged they'll come to you with ideas they'll be innovative they'll be collaborative um and they'll look after themselves and those around them and they'll help you look after your business mm. um, because that's really really important um you want people on board that are engaged in what you're trying to do and finally just some some little snippets there some little quotes i mean ultimately in most cases people don't leave a, a bad job they leave bad bosses and i think if i was to go around this zoom room now and say to each and every one of you tell me about a good boss and tell me about a bad boss you'll you'll have one of each um you probably have more of the, the bad bosses actually but um you know there's there's a lot of people out there who can um you know, impact our careers and will sit with us for a long time. Um, and we're actually very much now, and this has changed even more since the pandemic, we are very, very much now in a, a candidate's market. Um, and if you're not doing what the candidates think you should be doing as an employer and you haven't got the brand right and you're not looking after your teams and you haven't got good feedback on places like Glassdoor and, you know, if there's any negativity, they'll move on and, and look for somebody else to work for. Um, so long, long gone are the days of, an, you know, sitting down in an interview and someone saying, you tell me why I should give you this job. Now what's happening is candidates are absolutely sitting down and saying, you tell me how you're going to engage me, how you're going to keep me, how you're going to train me, how you're going to develop me and how you're going to pay me. And can I work flexibly when I want to work? So... <laughs> Um, so it's very much a very, very different market. So that is my whistle stop tour of uh, HR. I hope that's OK, Derek, because I know you wanted me to scale back the presentation. I no, did that was no, no, that was fantastic, Charlotte. Thank you very much. Got two or three questions before we before we stop the recording, because it's very, very interesting and very, very helpful. A really scary, scary area for us generalists. Um, have you encountered any any special difficulties when dealing with volunteers at a charity is Godfrey's first question. And the yeah, second... absolutely. Um, so, oh. yeah, so you can't have the same raft of legislation because they're not actually employees. But I always advise clients to put some rules and regulation in and perhaps to put a volunteer complaint policy in. But actually, what's really interesting about the volunteers sort of and the charitable sector where you do have a lot of volunteers is um, I, I suppose you would describe it almost as like a maybe a bit of a sense of entitlement because somebody is giving up their time for a charity or a cause that they feel passionate about. Um, there are certain expectations that you have to be incredibly grateful for that and that you're going to treat them differently. Mm. Um, and that can be a little bit problematic because, you know, particularly in organisations where perhaps the volunteers are working with um, vulnerable young adults or um, vulnerable older people um, and there is a raft of legislation, um, it can be quite tough to sort of rein volunteers in. So it's really interesting. So it's a very interesting dynamic. There is definitely a switch because there is a, an expectation of do because of a donation of time. Wow. And the second question is uh, linked to my question, I think, uh, is, um, is there, in your experience, are the cases of gender discrimination growing? Read the 16 definitions of gender now, or something, you know, the trans situation. And um, yeah. of course, recently, a lot of inappropriate behaviour uh, in offices and at work's been all over the press. Um, what can you tell us about that? <laughs> Well, it's I mean, the, the whole gender piece is um, is ever evolving. And as I say, no, you know, always a learning day. Um, 
as the the definitions get wider the the problems get uh, get you know come to the come to the forefront really um and we don't necessarily know all the answers at this stage but yes there are definitely um situations where we do have to think about how um how we treat people and how uh how you know people with a um choosing how to represent themselves uh want to be treated within the workplace um and i mean i went to event an event recently where um we had somebody who had um you know had an operation and had gone through the transgender process um and you know he was talking uh, about his journey as him and then his journey to her um and how he was treated in that process um and how he uh, at the time when he went to his organization and said i am i am me him but i'm going to go through this process and i'm going to become her um and they uh, weren't very nice to him at all and um it wasn't very well received and it became he was very ostracized and not very well supported um and yeah so you know you have to be very mindful um and we have to look at every single case on its own merits sure. um you know and, and different people feel very differently about different things so we just have to be very open um and we have to have open discussions and we we have to get some of this stuff out on the table and talk about it. Sure, great. Uh, because stop we've got that. to break that bias. Can you stop with screen sharing? That'd be quite useful. Yeah, sure. In, in time, thank you. And then what about uh, inappropriate behaviour? Uh, no specifics, but there seems to be a lot in the press at the moment. There is. There is. I mean, I've done quite a few um, cases around inappropriate behaviour over the years, um, you know, sexual harassment. And some of it is not terrible. It's just not okay in that, um, you know, that that times have moved on. It's different times. Um, I did a case recently where an individual had uh, sort of made just just some inappropriate comments that just weren't weren't sort of weren't cricket in today's age, put it that way. Um, and actually in his uh, disciplinary hearing, he sort of said to me, if I'd have been if I'd have been in my 20s and I'd have made those comments, it would have been OK, wouldn't it? To which I said, well, actually, no, no, it wouldn't. Because two of the young ladies who have come forward and said that they're not happy with your your conduct and your behaviour, they said it doesn't really matter whether you're the same age as my dad or not. The comments were inappropriate. Mm. Um, so it's it's very much, you know, time has moved on. Um, but, you know some some behavior is very serious some is, is just it, it's just not okay but it's not terrible um but obviously what we have to do is deal with all the cases with compassion um and empathy and care and consideration because actually i dealt with another case um 18 months ago where a chap was accused of some inappropriate behavior and he was going to lose his job albeit with a settlement agreement um but he uh couldn't handle that and so he sought a different way out um and uh, took his own life so again you know as hr people we have to be very mindful that we are playing with people's emotions and that we are dealing with situations that could very seriously impact somebody's well-being um so you know all we could do is do a thorough investigation make sure that we dot the i's across the t's in terms of looking into these things um, and that we treat everybody equally and fairly and, and as in as best way as we can, given the circumstances. No, thank you. We've got quite a lot of questions in the chat box, which we <laughs> haven't got time for. So would you stay um, and cover those or come back another time and yeah, uh, no worries. handle that for? I've got one last question. Um, stress um, seems to be an excuse for everything now. Now, I'm probably not allowed to say that, and it's probably not the case. So you'll probably tell me off, but I read that 73 percent of people have um have uh, a, a mental health issue every year which i found at my age i found unbelievable but um how do you handle that you're a mental health first aider but how do you suss it out whether they're just spinning it or it's true very very difficult um but um again that early intervention is key and if you've got access to a good hr person 
um, you'll start to have those conversations nice and early. So you pick it up from things like short term persistent sickness absence. Um, so if somebody's, you know, if you get someone who has 10 individual days off in the space of a couple of months, you might be sort of thinking to yourself, OK, what, why? Um, and if there are lots of different reasons, then you would have a conversation and say, look, what's going on? Is everything OK? Is there anything we need any support with? What do you need help with? Um, and, you know, you would start that conversation nice and early uh, and and you would start to get a feel for, um, you know, the genuine stuff versus mm -hmm. the non genuine stuff. Um, people do have a lot of stuff going on. If you think about how how we all are now in the world of connectivity, we don't switch off. You know, we don't switch off. I go on holiday. My laptop's the first thing in the case. Um, so, you know, we don't switch off. We don't. Um, we are accessible to everybody all the time, unless we're very, very good at, at putting those boundaries in place. Mm. And particularly a small business owner. So I work with a lot of small businesses. Um, you know, it's your own business. So you can't necessarily do that. And you don't want to um, because, you know, you're protecting your business and your investment. Sure. But, um, you know, stress is is there. So we would do things like stress risk assessments. We would refer people to occupational health assessments. We would, the one thing we're absolutely not, as I say, you know, we're not the internal police, but we're also not medical professionals. I've heard a lot. I've seen a lot. And and I could talk around a lot of age, uh, a lot of health issues to try and get to a point where we get somebody into the relevant uh, medical expert. Um, but we aren't medical experts and we we can't make medical decisions. So we have to sort of access other support services around us to to help bring that knowledge in into the fold. Um, and it, and as I say, it can become very quickly apparent when that there is a genuine issue and a and a non genuine issue. Perhaps when somebody's giving you a little bit of a run around. Sure, Charlotte, that's fantastic presentation. Very clear, great slides. Thank you. Um, how does anyone get hold of you uh, live or watching this on YouTube or listening to this in Spotify? Because there's going to be a lot of people out there that are going to need your help. <laughs> OK, so um, my company is Metro HR Limited. So you can find me at www.metrohr.co.uk. Uh, there's also a hello app through there and a contact form. So you're welcome to come through there. Um, I do have a LinkedIn account. If anybody wants to find me on LinkedIn, it's Charlotte Alfrey. Um, I am I, well, I'm just trying to think what I've got. I've got a, a LinkedIn page. I've got a Facebook company page. Um, I'm on Instagram for my sins. <laughs> um, so there's lots of places that you can find me. Brilliant. Brilliant. Well, thanks again, Charlotte. And can I ask uh, members of Monday Night Live to give Charlotte the appreciation in the normal way? Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's been great. Absolute pleasure. And I hope we'll uh, get you back on again. Thanks. Oh, who knows? <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Charlotte. Thank you.